All right. Saw a video of Gary's, and he's a little bit, well, why are you even going into this? We're going to talk about whether slavery was okay or not. Yeah. Well, I'm going to describe how I got sort of suddenly pulled into this Thomas Jefferson issue. It's an interesting issue. I tried to resist going into it. But okay, you wanted to go into it. <coughs> this was my way of going into it. So here's how it happened. Wrote some notes ahead of time so I, I remember what I wanted to say. First of all, there's the rhetorical rape apologist ploy. This is what Unseen Perfidy was using the whole rape apologist issue for. Pretty sure he doesn't think too lowly of Thomas Jefferson, probably, but maybe he does. Um, but I, I don't think he actually thinks that, that Thomas Jefferson was like Jeffrey Dahmer, you know, and totally, uh, you know, like, I don't know, a bad leader that that uh, that somehow, you know, might made right, and we think that, that they're good. I don't think he thinks that, but maybe. Even if he does think it, it's this rhetorical ploy to call you a rape apologist. Why is it just a rhetorical ploy? Because it's technically, there's a technical argument where technical means indirect. Gary doesn't do rape apology in general, never. I've never seen that. I didn't see that this time. What I saw um, what I saw was great figure apology, right? Thomas Jefferson apologist, that's what you are, Gary. And and that's actually a kind of defense for you. See, I can't say that you're not technically wrong at all because I think you're totally technically wrong. Uh, and I don't approve of great figure apologia, right? So that's where we differ. I, there's no way for me to, to try to defend you and circle up with your wagons if that's what you, who knows why, would expect or want to demand, not expect, and just not be, you know, whatever. I'm going to have to defend you this way of going, well, the issue isn't really rape apology. We're talking about Thomas Jefferson apology. I mean, we could probe that if you guys were more, like, consistent, less flighty little runny poodle dogs. Even you, Gary, in your own belligerent-sounding ways, Mr. Sensitive Poodley, oh, no, dog. And the way we could probe that is by the fact that Sally Hemings was herself already the product of a white man and his slave, and it was Jefferson's father-in-law. That's interesting. I haven't heard, Gary, I haven't heard you defend her father-in-law. You would have no reason to. You're defending Thomas Jefferson because of things like the Declaration of Independence. You don't want him trashed because hero stuff. And it's not that you think it's okay, slavery and rape. That's also obvious, and another reason it's not really properly called rape apologia when you're defending Thomas Jefferson or slavery promotion or anything like that. Because usually what you hear the apologists say, especially at the street jungle philosophy level, is, is not that those things are okay, but like what Gary was saying, we can't try it now, we can't, you know, various versions of it's better not to talk about it. It's confusing and the values of the time and just a million reasons, whatever. Don't talk about it. So it's really about don't talk about the negatives of the great men, the great figures. And my problem with that is we do that not just with the past, we do it right now. I, I don't want to do that. Um, it, it goes both ways. It's like I like the VW bug and the fact that Hitler was behind it commissioning it and, and getting it built. I say it, it's, it's sort of general specifications even, that's just a separate thing. It doesn't make Hitler great. It doesn't, obviously, right? It doesn't make the VW wrong. It's, this is how real life works, real people. So why? Well, I, I think it is better talked about, right? Not, not untalked about. And I think if we want to talk about things like the, our founding fathers at all, then it's better to talk about the whole picture and not try to glorify them. I think it's a way of glorifying history to glorify ourselves, and it just makes us fucking crazy, like personality disorder crazy. So some examples. Thomas Jefferson, you know, he used to, would have qualified as, you know, 
I really wish to see it, that it wasn't as bad as it seems. But I don't even feel that way about Thomas Jefferson anymore. I don't like him. I see him as the, the rich guy that wants to be nice to the slaves, and he thinks that's a better, happier way to run a happy little plantation. He doesn't want to get rid of plantations. He doesn't want to get rid of profiting off of breeding other people. And that's how the United States kind of is. It's kind of like a giant slave plantation where you try to treat the slaves really well. Well, that's wearing out and things are getting pretty shitty again because they don't want us to have health care or any guarantees or anything. We're slaves. Whereas Jefferson, how do you live most of your life bankrupt? How do you feed yourself? Because they keep letting you borrow. I mean, in debt. They keep letting you borrow. Why? Because course you're supposed to have something the slaves aren't so better examples are MLK when I found out MLK was che cheating on his wife which you know to each their own and stuff but he was a pastor and whatnot that was kind of surprising but I don't go oh maybe the FBI made that up they didn't really have it. it's corroborated or another example is Nietzsche. He says things that are objectionable every once in a while, especially about women, a few times. And I was still trying to make sense of that and do an apology for him um, uh, when I was reading that, and, and there's, there's roots to do that. He says these are just my personal truths. But actually, after reading Nietzsche enough, I realized he says that you can't really get his philosophy. You've got your own philosophy. I mean, some sparks might, clicks might go click and spark, you know, from reading my stuff, it's an inspiration. You might have an inspiration looking at a beautiful vista, too. The point is your idea is almost forming, and then, you know, I might be saying it out loud or something, but you're really coming to it from your own direction, less than me teaching you and dragging you to this water and then telling you to drink. You came up and had a drink from the water that I that I had, but really the spring was right there, and if I hadn't been here first, then you would have got to the water. It might have taken you a little bit longer to look around and find the actual water. And I think Nietzsche put in some of these personal things sort of on purpose, because he also out and out said, it's like, I'm calling for the future, but I'm of the age of war. I'm the kind of dude that thinks Napoleon was a pretty cool character and strong-willed, and yeah. But he also says, I'm a part of this age of war, this death and dying thing of the Christian era I'm heralding the end to. I'm still a part of it, right? We're on a staircase, and I see where it's going, and we're going there. But don't forget, and he didn't want to be worshipped. He didn't want people to be able to set out apologia for him and deify him like some sort of figure of Thomas Jefferson, like in history. The smiling black faces on his plantation. That's just the kind of stupid bullshit where Americans lie to themselves. Now, I don't, I think that's not useful. Okay. Now, why that particular thing? Well, I went off and I was reading things uh, because I wanted to just put more facts in, whatever they are. You know, I didn't care if that guy turned out right or not. I just wanted it to be a uh, historian type source because I know they actually put quotes from the letters that they were read that gave them uh, the impression that they're of how they're characterizing things and you get some primary stuff and you go through and then you can actually you fact checks on the fact and discuss the uh, interpretation with values and other interpretive techniques and the main story in there though that links this directly to whether or not uh, what it would mean to ask the question uh, of consent on Sally Hemings' part is uh, has nothing to do with her emotional state of mind because that's Stockholm Syndrome related you've been put into a situation or like grooming and you just, it's not based on that and as a matter of fact I've said and will repeat uh, as far as I know and my suspicion is she probably loved Jefferson's daughters that she was the nanny of and I feel certain she loved her own children and she was, um, she didn't fight it. But the question of consent, and an interesting thing that Annette Gordon-Reed said was that in the stories in the Hemings' family about their relationship, they don't say anything about how Sally felt about, about Jefferson, just how Jefferson felt about Sally. And the, the dark
dark side of Thomas Jefferson's story has a uh, has this uh, thing about James Hubbard. The son of a servant that Thomas Jefferson really liked. And he tried to bring this person and, and give him extra skills and the ability to rise up to, to um, you know, a craftsman, uh, you know, blacksmith or something. Is indicative of this question of consent and the kindly slave owner, right? Because some kindly slave owners, they just want to feel good about themselves, or some of them think that people are more productive when they're they're happy and motivated. And um, so I think those are the only reasons. It can't be morally, per se, uh, unless you don't know that morally people should be free, which Jefferson did know. So James Hubbard's story, I'll just remind you, he uh, came as a boy to Monticello. He wasn't so good in the nail factory at first, but he was very diligent. He became the top uh, person in terms of waste, not wasting much rod. And um, then he ran away. When he came back, he was not punished, and within a year seemed to be back in Jefferson's trust. But then he got caught stealing a bunch of nails. And the letters and whatnot said, you know, they all expected to at least beat him. The, the, the official punishment for stealing anything, even just a couple pieces of bacon, was capital punishment. That could be commuted, of course, but um, that's what you're starting with. And the letters at the time from the foremans and stuff expected that they were gonna, he was going to at least get whipped and made an example of for running away. And Thomas Jefferson, in his infinite mercy, said, no, he's uh, suffered enough. I'm sorry, not for running away for stealing the stuff, that he would at least be beaten. He suffered enough, and even the people that wrote the letters said the guy was, like, begging and pleading and really was felt bad. And after that experience, he wanted to find religion, found religion. That involved letting him go to church, which was off of the Monticello nearby, and he used that to plan another escape. Then he escaped, and this time he got hunted down like several states away, drugged back, and finally Jefferson beat him and sold him to an overseer. Nobody knows ever what happened to him again. And that's what consent is like. You give you a lot of room. And then, when you just won't learn, the real answer. The real answer, that that... James Hubbard knew the real situation. He wanted his freedom anyway. He knew he he was lucky, not getting beat. He wanted to use that luck to get free. Okay. Now, trying to treat people nice enough so that they think they're willingly being treated well and they're consenting, when, if that doesn't work, you will beat them and sell them and split them up and things like that. That's not confusing to me. To me, that is the whip. That was... That those whippings that James Hubbard uh, was let off of were mind fuckery. They shouldn't have even been there. There's no way I count not whipping him for trying to get his freedom as a positive. It takes it at best back down to zero. Right? It, it takes it at, at best back down to zero. Because the, the prospect of getting beaten for wanting your fee freedom shouldn't even be there. So letting someone off the hook for that, yeah, that's the kind of mind fuckery kidnappers play. Okay. So Sally Hemings was either smarter than James Hubbard, which a lot of you seem like you'd have me believe. She would have been worse off if she was free in Paris than living with that Thomas Jefferson treating her so good. Like, like a pet, you know. A pet is better off being a pet. Except for this was a fucking human. And she accepted her freedom later. Went to live with their sons who accepted their freedom. So she was either smarter, or she didn't care about her freedom as much, 
Or she was the half-sister of Jefferson's wife and was raised in this mind fuckery, multi-generational mind fuckery. 